Good morning, everybody. Let's stand together. Let's stand together, and then I'm going to pray for us before we start our worship today. Lord Jesus, we are grateful that you allow us to be here. Father, I pray that your presence will be here among us as we lift up our voice, Father, and praise and worship you. And I pray that everything that we say and do bring honor and glory to your name, Lord. So help us to open up the heavens. Lord, we love you and pray this in your son, Jesus' name. Amen.
enjoy that. Yes. Thank you. You may be seated. Hello and welcome to Perry Creek Church. I'm Kelly Ulrich, one of the lead team members here, and we just want to say thank you. Thank you for being here and joining us for worship. Whether you are here in person or joining us online, um, whether you've been here since the very beginning of Perry Creek Church or today is your very first time, we are just delighted to see you. So thank you for taking time out of your day and uh, taking time to spend it with us. You know, that's a gift to us. So thank you very much. And we have an amazing service planned today. We're going to sing more worship songs. We're going to get to celebrate communion together. And we have an announcement to make. We are so happy to tell you that today, phase one of Perry Creek Kids opened up. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Do you know that it was one year ago tomorrow, on March 8th, 2020, that we held our last service at Riverbend? That is unbelievable, but it's true. And, you know, we had some great times over the summer where we had outdoor worship services and our families could be together and we could all worship together. But it has been a long time since our kids have actually been in church, and we've missed them so much. So we are really excited to begin welcome, welcoming them back to church today. And we're going to continue that welcoming process over the next couple of weeks as we um, – as we do Perry Creek Kids in phases. So watch your newsletter for more information about that. But today we've got our one to four-year-olds back in church, and we are just so happy to see them. Today we are also continuing in our sermon series from the book of Acts, and we called this series Resolve because so far we have seen how the apostles needed incredible determination or incredible resolve to accomplish the task that God had given them to do, to go and plant churches and share the gospel in new areas. Well, in the sermon today, we're going to see a little bit of a shift, and we're going to use that word resolve a little bit differently. Resolve isn't going to be something that the apostles need to have. It's going to be something that they do. You see, there's a problem. There is a big conflict brewing in these brand new churches that have just been planted. Um, they've got the people who have been there for a long time and the newcomers. They've got culture clashes. They've got false teaching going on. And there is just a whole lot of confusion about what is actually required to be accepted by God. So the Apostle Paul is headed to Jerusalem. And he is going to resolve this issue once and for all and set things straight. In fact, today's sermon is actually setting us up to learn about this amazing historic meeting called the Jerusalem Council, which we're going to hear more about next week. And fair warning, this is some heavy theological stuff. And we are going to cover a lot of ground today. So I would really encourage you to take a moment and grab a pen and some paper and jot down your questions as we go through this. As always, you can chat with us online or you can send us an email to info at perrycreekchurch.org if you hear something that you just have a question about. This is really, really important that we get this right because this is the heart of of the gospel that we are going to talk about today. So it is going to be a great day. Thanks again for being here, and let's continue to worship. Let's stand together. Here.
Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Gilbert. Thank you, Alex. Please be seated. Well, good day, Perry Creek. Um, I want to talk to you today about the topic of resolving our relationship to the Old Testament law. Resolving our relationship to the Old Testament law. You were hoping you could hear a lecture on that today, right? Um, I, I want to talk about how you and I relate to the commands of the first five books of the Bible that are really the foundation of the Old Testament. You know, having taught and pastored for 30 years, I have to say that there's a great deal of confusion amongst Christians about what exactly we should do with the Old Testament. You know, we're not sure what to do with it. Some Christians, to be honest, just ignore it, <laughs> right? You know, it's got some strange commands in there about what you can and can't eat. It's got some scary vengeance stuff and, and a bunch of names that you've never heard, all right? So they just sort of pretend like it's not in their Bible. Uh, other Christians I've known just sort of pull out the Old Testament when it suits them, right? Um, when they, you know, see a verse they like, like Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, you know, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. When they see a verse like that or when they see a rule that they like, like honor your father and mother, if they're a father or mother, then, you know, they go, this is God's word for me. But when they run into something they don't like, you know, like the part that says you can't eat shrimp, then they're like, well, that's an Old Testament command. Okay, <laughs> And over the years, I've seen Christians who ate shrimp and pork and worked on the Sabbath, all kinds of things that are forbidden by the Old Testament, but I've seen them use the Old Testament to say things like churches must have choir robes, or that women should only wear dresses, or that churches must have hymnals. They use the Old Testament when it suits them. So some Christians ignore the law, others pull it out when it suits them, but I have to say that almost all of us have some confusion over what our relationship to the Old Testament is and isn't, right? And to help us to, with that today, I just want us to do a little exercise from the law, all right? Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to read some commands from Leviticus chapter 19. And I just want you to make a mental note of the commands that you think a Christian is obligated to obey. Okay, so in other words, mark in your minds or on paper, whatever, the commands that because they are part of Leviticus 19 are direct commands to you. Right, let's see how this goes. Okay, and by the way, these are all, some of you are going to be like, I didn't know this stuff was in the Bible. These are all commands from Leviticus chapter 19. All right, here we go. Number one, do not steal. Obligated or not obligated, okay? Uh, do not lie. Okay, you're going, sounds familiar so far. Uh, here's one, each of you must respect his mother and father. And all the parents said, Amen. That's right. There we go. Okay, let's try the next one. Do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoos on yourselves. And now the moms are saying, you know, when you add this to the respect your mother thing, this is, this is airtight, right? Okay, no tattoos for my kid. All right, let's try another one. Do not hold back the wages of a, man, of a hired man overnight. <laughs> uh, do not trim the sides of your head or clip the edges off your beard. Now the kids are going, hey, here's the deal, I'll skip the tattoo thing if dad will get one of those haircuts, right? <laughs> okay, uh, okay, next one. Uh, do not wear clothing made of two kinds of material. Now mom's in trouble, all right? Um, next one, love your neighbor as yourself. Next one, you must observe my Sabbaths. Uh, let's try this. When you offer a fellowship offering to the Lord, sacrifice it in such a way that it will be accepted on your behalf. Hmm. Okay. Do not go over your vineyard a second time when you reap the grapes, but leave them for the poor. Here's one. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so you won't share in his guilt. 
All right, uh, let's see, last one, okay? Rise in the presence of the aged and show respect for the elderly. That was for Abby. And Abby, I just want to point out that I'm the only one who is now standing in your presence, okay? All right, okay, so did you kind of mark them in your mind? All right, chances are there were some of those commands that you felt like you should mark, right? Like, do not steal. You're going, oh, yeah, that's mine, okay? And then there were probably some that you felt like you should not mark, like wearing two kinds of cloth together, right? And, and then there were probably some that you, you kind of weren't sure. Okay? Like uh, rebuking your neighbor. You're going, what is that about? Okay, All right, but here's the thing. My main question today is not really which commands you marked and which ones you didn't. My main question is, why? Why did you mark some and not others? What is the basis on which you said this command I have to obey while this command I'm just going to ignore? What Was there a basic organizing principle behind your picking and choosing? Now, maybe some of you said, well, I, I marked commands that I thought were repeated in the New Testament, okay? Uh, maybe some of you didn't mark any. Okay, that's what I would have done, actually. Uh, but let me say that, uh, look, I've done this exercise with different groups of people before, and the majority of Christians do not, have no clue why they feel obligated to obey some of these commands and not others. When you get right down to it in the end, most people say, well, I, it's just kind of what I grew up hearing. So if you're confused about this, let me say you're not alone. All right, but it does highlight an important question. And the question is, what is our relationship to the law? Well, today we are continuing our study of Acts chapters 13 to 15 called Resolve. And today we have come to a chapter about uh, the relationship of Christians, particularly non-Jewish Christians like you and me, the relationship of Christians to the Old Testament law. We have come to a chapter where Paul and Barnabas and the apostles and elders and the church at Jerusalem all come together to resolve once for all the question, how do we relate to all those commands in the Old Testament? So our passage is found in Acts, 13, or Acts 15, verses 1 to 5, if you want to turn there. But Perry Creek, let me just tell you, we're not going to be spending most of our time in Acts today. Uh, rather, as we look at this question today, we're going to do two things. First of all, we're going to start in Acts 15 and see how the issue came about in the early church and why it was so important for them and why it's so important for us. So we're just going to find out how that arose from Acts 15. And then secondly, we're going to step out of Acts to the broader teaching of the New Testament. And we're just going to look at three questions about the law, the Old Testament commands, and our relationship to it. And, and guys, let me just say that <laughs> Kelly's right. Today's sermon is going to be a little bit challenging, okay? We're going to do a little bit of heavy theological lifting. If you're a visitor to Perry Creek, we're normally not quite this complicated. Um, but, but, you know, it's, this is so important for us as Christians. You know, not only does a clear understanding of this clarify your relationship to three quarters of your Bible, that's how much is Old Testament, okay, but it also affects our whole approach to Christianity. So I want us to look at this issue today, all right? Um, but I want us to start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, um, Lord, we need your help. Father, as we look at this issue, I'm aware that we have folks that are all over the map on their Christianity. Some have maybe wrestled with this issue and have a conclusion. Some have never maybe thought about this, but as they're hearing it, they're going, yeah, I need to think through this. And for some, this may sound like a uh, just sort of a theological jungle. But Holy Spirit, we have just prayed that you would be here. We have just prayed that we would listen to you. And so we want you to speak, and I pray that you would apply the truth of your word to every person that's here in, in, in whatever way is best. Lord, I pray that you would lead us to clarity in our understanding of how we relate to all those commands of the Old Testament. 
Father, I pray that you would, you know, for some of us, I just pray that they would develop a new confidence in their Old Testament, that they would look at it eagerly, waiting to see what you're going to see because they understand their relationship to it better. Lord, for some, I, I just pray that they would be set free today from law-based Christianity. Lord, from the idea that we somehow get your approval by measuring up to a list of rules, I, I, I want every person here to be set free from that. So, Lord, today as I speak, would you speak? Would you just guide? If you want to take anything out or put anything in, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us powerfully. And it's only through, through you that our lives can be transformed. So we offer this time in the Word up to you. And it's in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen. Well, I want to start today by pointing out that we need to resolve this issue of our relationship to the law, okay? We need to resolve the issue of our relationship to the law. So hopefully you can see from the little exercise that we just did that there's a little bit of confusion there. So it's important that we resolve this question of what you and I as Christians are supposed to do with the commands of the Old Testament. We're supposed to resolve that. So, so let's just look at, at how this came to be an issue in the early church, and then I'll tell you why resolving that is, was so important for them and is for us. Okay, so this issue, let's just go back historically. This issue came about because of Paul's first missionary journey. So on the mission trip that we just studied, as you may remember, Paul and his companion Barnabas had great success bringing all kinds of people to faith in Jesus. So Luke tells us that they brought Jews to faith in Jesus. He tells us that they brought Gentiles who had converted to Judaism to faith in Jesus. But the most notable thing that Luke tells us by far was that many Gentiles, many non-Jews who had no relationship to Judaism, Gentiles that had not converted to Judaism, also came to faith in Jesus. And this was a huge deal. If you remember from last week's passage, it was so important to Paul that that was his whole summary of his missions trip. You know, he came back and when his sending church said, give us a report, he didn't mention the slander he received. He didn't mention that he was stoned and left for dead. What he said was, God opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Paul was over the moon about what God had done here. So he stayed in Antioch, his home church, for about a year. And that's when the trouble started. Look at what Luke tells us in Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Luke says, some men came down from Judea in Antioch, and they were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. So some guys from Judea who, who claimed to have the backing of the big church in Jerusalem came to Antioch, and they began to teach. Now, Luke emphasizes circumcision here, but in a few verses, it's going to be clear that these guys wanted the Gentiles to obey all the laws of the Old Testament. Okay, so these guys came, and they were teaching, and they said, yeah, here's the thing. Okay, Jesus is great. Yeah, yeah. He, he is the sacrifice for our sins, just like in the Old Testament. Okay, he's the Messiah that was prophesied in the Old Testament. He's fulfilling the promises of the Old Testament. So they said, if, look, if you want to follow Jesus, you really have to start by obeying the Old Testament. You know, they said, you, you know, the same God that sent Jesus, he's the same God who, who gave us the laws of the Old Testament. And he's the same God that chose the Jews as his special people. So if you want to follow God, you really need to become a Jew. You know, you need, you need to follow God the way that we've followed him for centuries. You need to obey the Old Testament, starting, if you're a man, with the command to be circumcised. So they're saying, look, Jesus is great. We're, we're glad that you believe in him. But if you want to be a true follower, you know, if you want the platinum card, if you want us to teach you the secret handshake, all right, you have to start by becoming a Jew. Now, here's the thing. You know, at first, that might not have seemed so bad. I mean, God is the God of the Old Testament. He's the same God, right? And, and the Jews had been following him for centuries. So why wouldn't you learn how to follow him from, from a Jew? 
And look, even if you didn't completely buy into their argument, why, why not just go along to get along, right? You know, these guys seem to really know their Bibles. If you were Gentile, I guess circumcision would be one really difficult step that you could take to prove your devotion to God. So why not just do it and be in the club? And, and if you were a Jew, you were already in the club, so why not just go along with it? That's what these guys were teaching. And, and this attitude spread like wildfire through the church at Antioch. And it was, so in the end, it wasn't just the church members that were buying into it. Some of the teachers of the church, some of Paul's companions, in fact, one of the apostles was kind of going along with this. In fact, let me show you how far this spread. In Galatians 2, Paul zooms in and describes this situation in detail. Look at what he says in Galatians 2, 11 to 13. Paul says, when Peter came to the Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, that's these guys, okay, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belong to the circumcision group, to these, these guys, these Judaizers that are teaching this. So then Paul goes on and says, the other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Wow. Okay, so even Peter and, and to a lesser extent Barnabas are joining in and doing this. You know, when the, when the Judaizers aren't around, Peter eats at the Gentile table in the lunchroom, like the nerd table, right? But then as soon as these guys show up, he goes to the cool kids table, right? And he treats the uncircumcised Gentiles like they just sort of don't quite make the grade, right? Because according to the Old Testament law, these Gentiles who were uncircumcised were religiously, ceremonially unclean. So Peter and maybe Barnabas just, you know, back away a little bit. Now, just to be clear, Peter and Barnabas do not agree with everything that these guys are teaching. We'll see that in just a minute. But they're going along to get along, right? And here's the thing. You know, it may not have seemed, it, it, it probably seemed like a small deal to Peter at first, right? You know, just withdraw a little bit make the Judaizers happy, keep peace. But Paul realized that this was a massive issue. That they're dividing who's really a part of the body of Christ. They're dividing it into insiders and outsiders. And to top it all off, probably right in the middle of this scene with Judaizers, had worked their way into the churches that he had just planted with Barnabas in Galatia. So they were convincing Gentiles that they could not be saved unless they were converted to Judaism and obeyed the commands of the law of Moses. Now Paul was furious. And he responded to the situation with three very decisive actions. First of all, he confronted Peter. You can read about it in Galatians 2, but let me just cut to the chase and say he told Peter, your behavior when you're withdrawing from these guys is not in line with the gospel. So he did that. Secondly, Paul wrote the letter of Galatians, which, like I said last week, was Paul's angriest letter. You know, he wrote, the, he said, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And so he told them in no uncertain terms that they were not to yield to these false teachers. They were not to put themselves under the Old Testament law. So he did those things. And then the third thing that Paul did was he took a trip to Jerusalem. So look at Acts 15, verse 2, says this. This, in other words, the teaching of the Judaizers, brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and, dis and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and the elders about this question. So I think here's what happened. Paul said, okay, look, these guys keep claiming that they are coming from Jerusalem. They keep claiming that they have the authority of James, the leader of the church of Jerusalem. Let's just go to Jerusalem and see if it's true. Let's just sort this out. 
Verse 4, when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything that God had done to them. Okay, so they're giving the same missions report that they gave at their home church, right? Everybody is loving it. People are like high-fiving each other. Look at, you know, all the good things that God did. But now look at verse 5. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. I don't know how that is coming over on the sound system, okay, but here's the deal. There's a big showdown, right, between Paul and these Christian Pharisees. Don't you just love the Pharisees? <laughs> They put the fun in fundamentalist, right? (laughs) Okay, and you can see that that the church is going to have to deal directly with this question. What is our relationship to the Old Testament law? What do we do with it? Do we have to obey it? Do we have to become Jews before we can become Christians? Do, Do we ignore it? Do we just say that's the Old Covenant and it doesn't have anything to do with me? What is our relationship to the Old Testament, okay? And let me say, this is actually a fairly tricky issue to resolve. I mean, on the one hand, I can see the logic of the Judaizers, can't you? You know, if the God of the New Testament is the same God as the God of the Old Testament, and if he never changes, why would his commands to his people change? Right? Why why wouldn't they be binding on us? Doesn't the Bible say all Scripture, and when it says that, it means the Old Testament. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. Okay, so shouldn't the Old Testament guide us? So on the one hand, you know, it seems like maybe we are supposed to be under the law. But on the other hand, the New Testament makes some statements that really make us think twice about whether we're supposed to, you know, live to obey the law or not. In, in Romans 6, Paul says twice, we are not under law, but under grace. In, in Romans 10, Paul says, Christ is the end of the law to everyone that believes. In Colossians 2.14, the Bible says, Christ canceled the written code with its regulations and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And as we'll see next week, Acts 15 seems to indicate that we are not under law. Okay, so this can be kind of a tricky issue. But guys, it's important. This was important in the early church. It was dividing the church. It divided the apostles. That They had people teaching that you couldn't be a Christian unless you obeyed the law of Moses. So they had to resolve it, right? But, But let me say this. We need to resolve it as well. Right? I mean, the Old Testament is three-quarters of your Bible. I, I read the Old Testament every day. So we need to know, how does this thing relate to our lives? And beyond that, let me say that understanding this issue of how we relate to the commands of the Old Testament also helps us understand how we relate to the commands of the Bible, the New Testament as well, in general, right? Is my Christianity all about following rules? Is that how I please God? If not, what part do the rules play? Okay, so next week we're going to look at the specific answer they gave to this question in the early church. But today I just want to kind of go big picture here, all right? We're going to pull back and look at the whole New Testament. We're not going to look at the whole New Testament, but, you know, several verses. And and, and we're just going to look at three questions that help us understand how we relate to the Old Testament law and even to law to the commands of the bible in general okay so three questions about law right and the first one is this is the law good or bad is the law you know the commands of the old testament is it good or bad and i ask this question for a couple of reasons first of all because some people just don't like the old testament law Right? You know, they read strange commands, like some of the ones that we read. There are harsh commands in there. So some people just don't like what they think the God of the Old Testament is like. And so they look at the law as something bad. Now, in addition to this, the New Testament makes some statements about the law that, to be honest, seem pretty negative. Okay, the New Testament says, for example, that the law can't justify It can't make us, uh, put us in right standing with God. 
right? The New Testament says that the law was a compromise. It says that the law enslaves us. It says all who rely on the law are under a curse. So that all raises the question, is the law good or bad? Was the law a mistake of some kind? Was it a bad thing? Or in spite of its weaknesses, is it somehow good? Well, I just want to make sure that we are are, are clear on this, so I'm going to say it directly. Listen, the Old Testament law is good. Okay, it's absolutely good. But the flesh is weak. The law is good, but the flesh is weak. Okay, so the law is good. The law is a reflection of God's character. God is, by his nature, just and good and and, and righteous and loving, right? He, He doesn't just love what is good. God is what is good. So any standard that he gives to people is a reflection of his good character. And the law code that he gave to Israel was good. Now, you know, if you read it, it's true that the law was a compromise, right? The law was not a pure expression of true righteousness. It took man's weakness into account. So the law, if you read the law, it made, it, it, it made uh, allowance for things like failed marriage. Here's what to do when your marriage fails. It made allowance for things like slavery and vengeance and dishonesty. Now, you know, these are not a part of who God is, but the law met people where they were at. And so there were some compromises. It's also true that the law has some things that we don't understand. You know, I don't understand some of the commands about what the Israelites were allowed to eat and what they weren't allowed to eat. I don't understand all of the commands about what makes a person clean or unclean. I don't understand some of the harshness that I see. But guys, the law was good. It was a real expression of God's character. In in Romans 7, Paul says the law is holy and righteous and good. Now listen, we can focus on the weird stuff, okay? And there are commands that sound really weird, but I want you to recognize that the law was a wonderful thing. You know, I've been having my devotions for the last three months in the first five books of the Bible, and it's amazing. You know, when you really look at what the law has to say and how that differed from the other law codes of the cultures that were around Israel, it's amazing. And guys, the law did so many good things for Israel's culture. It provided for the poor without creating a welfare state. Right? Did you see that in the verse? You know, let the poor pick up the grapes. Let them have the respect of doing the work. Don't do it for them, but don't take from them either, right? So it provided for that. It, it, it also protected families. It prevented the spread of diseases. It showed people how to love their neighbors. It established a just legal system. So guys, the law was good. But there's a problem. The law was good. But the law was also ineffective. It was powerless. And it's powerless not because the law has a problem, but because we have a problem. You know, we have this, the Bible calls it flesh. You know, we have this fallenness in our character that makes us want to disobey God. Makes us always want to go off and do what we think is good for ourselves and just kind of ignore what he says. And the flesh is, always has an angle, right? So that even when we're trying to obey God's commands, we, we also have a little piece of us that's trying to wiggle out from under it, right? You have that thing in your heart? I'm, I'm a pastor. I've been at this for years, and I have it in my heart, okay? So always trying to get away with doing something that God didn't told us not to do or whatever, right? And listen, that's how we get religious hypocrites. Right? That's how we get people who know how to mind their religious P's and Q's but don't know how to love people. You know, the Pharisees, if you read uh, in the Gospels, the Pharisees were so scrupulous about observing the law that they literally picked every tenth leaf off of their spice plants to tithe to God. And then they turned around and they tried to stone Jesus for death be- to death because he healed someone on the Sabbath. Right? Look, somehow the flesh caused them to substitute religion for right and wrong. And that's why the law is ineffective. Because it has to work with the flesh. That's why it was a compromise. That's why it can't save. That's why it enslaves us, but it still can't control us. 
That's why it's so damaging to depend on the law. Okay, so was the law good or bad? Well, the law was good, but the flesh is weak, all right? Now, that leads us to our second question, and that's this. What is our relationship to the law? What is our relationship to the law? You know, what do we do with these Old Testament commands? Do they have authority over us? Are we supposed to obey them? You know, do, are they irrelevant? Do we ignore them? Or do we pick and choose the ones that we like? What is our relationship to the law? Okay, well, I don't have everything figured out about this, and there are good Christians that would disagree with me here, but I want to say something to you. The more I've studied my Bible, the more I believe this. The Old Testament law is not a direct guide to our behavior. Okay, the Old Testament law is not a direct guide to our behavior. Okay, so listen to this. I believe as Christians, we are free from all of the Old Testament law as a direct guide to our behavior. Okay, we're free from all of it as a direct guide to our behavior. So the Old Testament law can be an indirect guide to our behavior, but its requirements are not binding on us. Okay, and see, we all get that with the commands that seem weird and don't seem to have anything to do with right and wrong, right? Like, like you know, most of us eat shrimp and pork, right? Okay, um, we all wear clothing that's made of a blend of materials. We don't feel like we have to worry about that. Guys, we all trim our beards in the corners of our head, right? We, we all do that. So we look at all that stuff and we go, yeah, that's not binding. I don't have to worry about that, okay? But I'm saying, listen to me, I'm saying the other stuff, the stuff that is very moral, and makes sense to us also is not directly binding on us okay honor your father and mother from leviticus 19 not directly binding on us okay now listen the reason for that is not because the law is bad that's not a bad idea right that it's a great idea okay the, the reason is not because the law is not a reflection of God's heart that is a reflection of God's heart the reason isn't even because God doesn't want us to obey those Old Testament sort of moral commands right that's not what it's all about the reason that it's not binding is that the law is not our contract with God okay so let me explain what I mean look at this diagram it's up on the screen there. It's a fancy diagram that I put together, okay? Um, you know, like we just said, the law was good, right? It was a reflection of God's character. But notice that the law was a contract between God and the nation of Israel, right? That contract started with Moses and it ended with Jesus. Jesus said the law and the prophets were until the time that John the Baptist came. Paul says he died to the law in Galatians. In Romans, he says we're not under the law and that Christ is the end of the law. In Ephesians, uh, Paul says Christ abolished the law in his flesh with its commands and regulations. So listen, once Jesus came, the law was over. We are not ethnic Jews. We are not waiting for the Messiah, and it's not our contract. Okay, now if you look at the other side of the diagram... We now have a different contract with God, and our contract is called the gospel, or the New Testament, or the new covenant. Okay, now listen to me. The new covenant isn't new because it's a new list of rules, right? It's not like God just took the Mosaic law and took out some of the weird commands like don't eat pork and added some cool new commands like greet one another with a holy kiss which it does say in the New Testament, but we're not going to do that, especially not during COVID, okay? It's not like God, you know, just sort of swapped a few commands and then turns around and says, okay, uh, obey it, just like they did in the Old Testament. That's not the idea. This isn't just a new list of rules. The New Covenant is a completely different approach to God. The New Covenant is based on faith, and it gives us Jesus' righteousness, and see, it does have rules and commands and moral imperatives, right? The New Testament actually says, honor your father and mother, right? But here's the thing. At its core, the new covenant is not law. 
You know, even the commands that are given us in the New Testament are not meant to be treated as a list of laws. They're not meant to be assembled into a giant checklist of behaviors for the Christian. If anything, the commands of the New Testament are examples of how people who are being transformed by Christ live out their lives. Okay, so see, here's the thing. If you try to live out the new covenant, your Christianity, as a list of rules, you're going to end up enslaved, just like the Judaizers, just like the Galatians, right? Trust me, I've known dozens and dozens of Christians who try to live like the, the New Testament is a new set of laws, and it takes them to miserable places. I used to be one of them. Right? So, so what is our relationship to the law? It is not a direct guide to our behavior. Okay, We are under a different contract with God. The, the, the law was Israel's contract. Our contract is the gospel. All right. Okay, now question three. <laughs> Everybody still okay here? This is a bit of a fire hose, I know, but it's good for us. Guys, this is so important, right? Okay, question three. How do I use the Old Testament law? How do I use, you know, when I pick this thing up and I start reading it, what do I do with it, okay? Listen, when you hear me say that Christ is the end of the law and that the law is not a direct guide to our behavior and that the law is not our contract with God, you might be tempted to conclude that the Old Testament law has no use, that we should just ignore it, right? That it's not a guide for us at all. And I understand why you would think that, but that would be wrong. Okay, the Old Testament does have a use for the Christian. Even though it is not our contract, it is useful. And the reason that it's useful is found in the diagram that we were just looking at, okay? Look at it again. See, the law is not our contract, right? That's a contract with a different group of people, but, and here's the important thing, it's a contract with the same God, right? See, both of these contracts are reflections of the character of the same God. So both of them are useful for us. That's why 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all Scripture, and it's talking primarily about the Old Testament, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Paul is saying that the Old Testament is useful for Christians. It can teach and rebuke and correct and train in righteousness. And even though the Old Testament is not our contract, it is useful to Christians in a number of ways. You know, for one thing, the Old Testament points to the Messiah. Right? Everything from the imagery and the offerings and feasts to the direct prophecies that are found there to showing us our need for a Savior, the Old Testament points to the Messiah. Another example, the Old Testament teaches us about the kind of God we serve. Right? When we read the Old Testament, we learn that there's only one God. Right? We, we learn that the God is holy, that he's not to be approached lightly. We, we learn that he is wise and eternal and relational and present everywhere at once. And we learn that he wants his people to trust him. So the Old Testament teaches about what God is like. Right? And the Old, te the, the Old Testament also illustrates and clarifies the commands of the New Testament. So you know the New Testament says, do not engage in immorality if you're a Christian, Right? The Old Testament devotes chapters to telling us what God considers immoral, right? The New Testament says, remember the poor. The Old Testament shows, if you really read it in context, it shows us the balanced way that God views poverty, right? It's so beautiful. He's not interested in a welfare state, and he's also not interested in a state where the poor are taken advantage of. There's incredible balance there. So it shows us that, right? And the Old Testament also gives us insight into God's ethics. It, it, it shows him, us the way he wants his people to behave. So we can learn from the commands of the Old Testament. You know, a while ago, um, one of our members was talking to me on the phone. And this, this member has a friend, not from our church, who has been sort of a strong Christian, but, but is beginning to do some really unethical things that just sort of don't add up. 
And as we talked about this, this guy's concerned about this, whether there's something big and wrong going on in his friend's life. And he was asking me, what should I do? You know, so we talked about it. But when we talked about it, we looked at one of those verses in Leviticus 19, where it, literally what it says is, don't hate your brother in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so that you don't share in his sin. And as we talked about that, he decided, look, the right loving course of action for me is to go to him very humbly but very honestly and say, hey, I, I think things aren't adding up here. What's going on? Okay? But that came from looking at the law. Okay, so listen, what I'm saying is this. The law is useful in a number of ways, all right? All of its commands. If we truly understand them, they all reflect God's character, and they teach us who he is and what he wants from his people. Even though it's not our contract, it's useful. So let me give you an illustration that I've given some of you before, and I, I think this might help clear this up, all right? Um, you know, when I taught in college in Zimbabwe, there were times when I taught two sections of Greek at once. So I had a night class that would meet once a week, and then I had a day class that would meet three times a week, all right? And at the beginning of the term, I would pass out a syllabus with a course description and goals and assignments and dates and textbooks and all that kind of stuff, okay? All right, so let's just say that you had signed up for my once a week night Greek class, right? Well, you know, you could look at a syllabus from my day class and you could learn a lot from it, right? If you read that syllabus for the same class but from a different time, you could read that and you could see probably the kind of teacher I am, right? You could, you could see the kind of things I want my students to learn. Am I, am I, am I, do I require a lot of work or a little? Um, you know, what do I want people to learn? What are my goals? What textbook do I want you to lose, use? You know, you could look at that and it would be very useful. But you couldn't take that day class syllabus and say, oh, I have a paper due on uh, you know, Thursday, March 8th, or I have an exam on April 12th. Those details are not binding on you. Why not? Because that syllabus is not our contract, right? That, that syllabus for the other class is a contract between me and them. And listen, it's the same way with the law and the gospel. Okay, the law is not our contract. It has some of the same commands and principles that the New Testament does because it's from the same God, but it's not binding on us, okay? But you know what? We can learn so much from the law because the same God who revealed himself in the law, the God who showed us in the law what righteousness demands and taught us that he should not be approached lightly and gave us sacrifices as a constant reminder that the price of sin is death. That God is the same God who gave his son to us, who told his son to take on human flesh and to show us what it looks like when we live in obedience to God. And he's the same God who gave the life of his son so that we could be set free from the law. Okay, there's a lot of technical information in this sermon today, but let me just say this. If, if when I say I want you to have a relationship with God that is not based on obeying rules, if you go, what are you talking about? I've never heard that before. Please talk to me after the service. I want to share the gospel with you. I want to tell, how, tell you how you can be completely forgiven and have a relationship with God that is not based on rules, but is based on him transforming you through his Holy Spirit and through his gospel. Listen, it's the same God, even though it's not our contract. And so we learn of his goodness from the Old Testament, and we worship him. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I... I I pray that as we've looked at this issue, that this will be useful and, and, and transforming. Lord, some of us need to understand not to be afraid of our Old Testament. We need to read it and see what it teaches us about you. Father, some of us uh, need to grow in our relationship with you. 
And, and Lord, there may be some here today who are going, I, I thought my relationship with God was always based on rules. Father, I long for them to know the freedom of the new covenant, the covenant we're going to celebrate in communion and as we sing. So, Lord, we just ask that you would transform us as we understand better who you are. And it's in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen. Well, thank you, brother. And in light of that, we are going to now enter into a time where we come to the Lord's table. So first, I'm going to invite our worship team to come up. And if you have not received one of these uh, element, pre-made element packages, they are right there at the table at the entrance, and you can get up and grab one of those if you don't have one. But I want to invite you to grab that now uh, as we enter into this time. Um, yeah, what a joy, right, to come to the table, to be reminded of what Christ has done. You know, every time we come to the table, John and I will read a passage from Luke 22, which says this, Jesus, when instituting the Lord's Supper for the first time, made this comment, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So maybe as you've heard us read that passage before, maybe you're like, what does that mean? What, is, what are they talking about? What is Jesus talking about when he is talking about this new covenant? Well, that's what we talked about today, right? So it goes all the way back to a passage in Jeremiah 31 in the Old Testament where Jeremiah said this, prophesying about the new covenant that would come. He said, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. In the Lord's Supper, church, we are clearly reminded that because of the blood that was shed on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, by putting our faith in Christ, our sins once and for all are completely forgiven. Jesus ushered in a new covenant and that means, church, that we don't have to live up to the law, right? Even though we mess up, even though we don't obey everything the law tells us to do, Jesus has obeyed all of that. Jesus came and lived a perfect life, right, that we could never live and died a death on a cross that we deserve to die because we didn't measure up and obey the law. But we can put our faith and trust in Jesus because he is perfect and he obeyed the law perfectly. So even though you sin this week, I sin this week, maybe even sin on the way coming here to gather as a church, the blood of Jesus covers that sin now and for all of eternity. It is not by what we have done, right? It is not by what we do and how we obey the law that we can come to Jesus and celebrate what he has done for us and be in relationship with him, but is what Jesus has done for us. So brothers and sisters, I hope that as we come to the table today in light of what Pastor John preached in God's word today, that we can come and celebrate. We can celebrate what Christ has done for us, that we are welcome to be in relationship with him because of the blood that he shed on our behalf, that we can celebrate that we are forgiven once and for all because of the sacrifice that Christ has made for us. So if you are here today and you have trusted in Christ, if you belong to him and have a relationship with him, we invite you to come to the table and experience this grace and mercy that is offered us. You don't have to be a member at Perry Creek, but if you had trusted in Christ and follow him, this table is for you. If you're not a Christian today or maybe not sure what that means, again, I want to invite you, as Pastor John said, if you have questions about what that means to follow after Christ, please ask us. But we are just going to ask that you do not participate in the Lord's table as it is meant as an expression of our faith in Christ as his church. So, Jesus said this. On the night that he gathered with his disciples in the place that we call the upper room and instituted the Lord's Supper for the very first time, Jesus took the bread and Jesus broke it. 
and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he also took the cup. And he said, this cup represents the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I'm going to lead us in just a second to take these two elements. But before I do that, would you bow your head with me as we pray? Jesus, we just want to come and praise you and thank you for the sacrifice that you made for us so that we are not bound by the law any longer. God, it's not how we measure up. It's not what we do, but what Christ has done. And so church, I just want to give you just a, just a moment here to just praise God. Thank him for his sacrifice for you. Thank Jesus for the blood that was shed for you on the cross so that you could come to God, not based on anything that you have done, but on what Christ has done. Just spend some time thanking him and praising him for that. So Jesus, we do thank you and we praise your name. So now as we come to the table, I pray that you will help these truths to sink deeply into our heart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So you can take off that first layer where you find the wafer there. Church at Perry Creek, the body of Christ given to you. Now you can take your cup and in the cup we are reminded that this is the blood of Jesus that was shed for you. Amen. Now let's worship together and celebrate this great truth that we have in the hope of the gospel. without hope and no place to be Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested in my life Ash was redeemed only beauty remains My orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet My feet rose to death When death was arrested
Goodness Church, sing it out. just a moment. Well, church family, thank you again for being here with us today. Um, we hope that you've been encouraged and blessed by our time worshiping the Lord and studying his word. And listen, we covered a lot of ground today, right? Talked about some really, really important stuff. I think we're going to have some amazing discussions in our small groups this week, but let me just remind you that if you have heard something today that just causes you to ask some questions, um, if you're confused about something, if you're concerned about something, or even if you just want to talk about it, um, then grab one of us after the sermon today, after the service, or send us an email. You can always do that at info at perrycreekchurch.org. We would love the opportunity to hear your questions and talk about them and share the gospel with you. Now, before we go today, let me tell you about some important things that are coming up here at Perry Creek Church. And the first one is our Next Steps class on March 22. And here's what that means. If you've been hanging around Perry Creek for a little while and you'd like to know more about our church or you'd like to find out some service opportunities or you have questions about the gospel, Next Steps class is for you. Because no matter where you're at, in your journey with Jesus, there is always a next step, and we would love to help you find it. So we're going to have a class on March 22, and it's just a time for us to get together and share our stories together. Um, you'll get to know some new friends. You'll get to hang out with us, and we will even feed you dinner. Now, full disclosure, 
Next Steps class is part of our membership process, but attending a class does not obligate you to join the church or anything like that. There's literally no pressure. So if free food and a chance to make some new friends sounds like something you'd like to do for a couple of hours, then send us an email to info at perrycreekchurch.org and we will get you signed up. There will also be a link in your newsletter to sign up for Next Steps class. Now the next thing that you need to know about is Easter is coming. And this is the most important time of the year for Christians because it's the time we get to proclaim Jesus' victory over death. And because of Jesus' resurrection, we all, each and every one of us, have forgiveness of our sins. We can have eternal life by believing in him. So our pastoral staff has been working really hard to put together some great things for us to celebrate Easter and make it really meaningful this year. So watch your newsletter for details and get ready to celebrate. For our benediction today, I want to read to you from the book of Colossians, and this is chapter 1, verses 21 to 23. At one time, you were separated from God. You were enemies in your minds because of your evil ways. But because Christ died, God has brought you back to himself. Christ's death has made you holy in God's sight. So now you don't have any flaw. You are free from blame. But you must keep your faith steady and firm. You must not move away from the hope the good news holds out to you. This is the good news that you heard. And that, church family, is the good news that we get to share. Perry Creek Church, you are now on mission.